Welcome to Dear Diaspora, a podcast celebrating the African diaspora and the change makers, innovators, and entrepreneurs working to make our world a better one to live in. I'm your host, Ndola Koa. Let's get started. So before I introduce the next guest, don't forget to leave a review, subscribe, and rate on Apple Podcasts. It makes a huge difference, and one key way that it does that is people are more likely to check out an episode or two if they see that there are ratings and if they see that people are actually listening to the content and enjoying the content, and uh, one way to show that you enjoy the content is by leaving a review so for everyone that's left a review thank you so much i really appreciate it and if you are listening on any other podcast listening platform please make sure you follow the podcast so you're notified each sunday when new episodes come out and lastly if you're listening on spotify you can actually share the podcast that you listen to on instagram stories just like you would a song so if you're listening to dear diaspora on spotify you can share that in your insta stories and i will repost um, so of course tag dear diaspora and i will repost and really appreciate you spreading the word about the podcast Happy Sunday, dear Diaspora fam. Thank you so much for tuning in to episode 34 of the show. For today's episode, I had the pleasure of interviewing Edna Martinson and Clarence Tan, co-founders of Bottle Learning, an edtech platform with an adaptive learning algorithm that delivers just right questions to students. So Bottle Learning is really interesting because it helps identify and addresses gaps to help kids who are behind so they can catch up while also providing the right level of rigor to challenge kids who are ahead. So during the conversation, Edna and Clarence share their background. So Edna is from Uganda and Ghana, and Clarence was born in San Francisco, but kind of grew up in Singapore and spent some time living in Beijing and Shanghai and they actually met in Kansas City, Missouri at church. And during the conversation, they actually share more about their love story and how they went viral after Clarence shared how his parents originally weren't keen about him dating outside of his race. They also dive into what sparked their interest in entrepreneurship, what it's like to work with a spouse on a startup, And they also share more about how COVID has impacted their business, how they've been able to pivot and actually increase their user base by over a thousand percent. So they went from, I think, a little under 2000 users to over 30,000 now, which is quite impressive. I can't wait for y'all to listen to this conversation. If you have any sort of interest in ed tech or just learning how your business can survive and even maybe thrive during this time, this is definitely the episode for you. Without further ado, here is my conversation with Edna Martinson and Clarence Tan. Edna, Clarence, thank you so much for being guests on the show. I'm so excited to have you both. Thank you. It's great to be on the show. Yep, it's a pleasure to be here. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to just getting to know you guys a bit better. And so can we start by getting to know your backgrounds a bit? Like, where are you both from and where did you grow up? Yeah, um, so I am half Ghanaian, half Ugandan. So my mom is from Ghana. Uh, my mom's from Uganda. My dad's from Ghana. I was born in Uganda. Um lived there and around East Africa, um, Ethiopia, Kenya for a while until um, middle school. And then I moved to Ghana. Um, And then I came to America 10 years ago. Wow. 10 years ago. And how old were you when you came to the U.S.? I was 16. And Clarence, how about you? Yeah. So I grew up in San Francisco. But really early on, when I was six years old, I moved to Singapore, and then I lived there for another seven years, and then I was in um, living in Shanghai and Beijing and Hong Kong for another five to six years, and then I came to Kansas City 10 years ago as well, actually 11 years ago. Nice. Wow. And, and could you share a bit about like how you guys met? 
Yeah. Um, so we met in church, actually. Um, Clarence plays the electric electric guitar, and um, I do the live mixing. So I'm like sound engineer for church. Um, so we met with me, you know, mixing the sets that he was playing on. And then we just came friends. He loved rock climbing. So I pretended to love rock climbing <laughs> and <laughs> did that for a bit. And then we started dating shortly after. Yeah. And as soon as we started dating, she's like, I don't want to rock climb anymore. I'm like, <laughs> who are you? Oh, my gosh. Oh, that's so sweet. And so you guys met in Kansas City then? Yeah, in Kansas City. Mm, yeah. That's so awesome. So I looked you guys up um, and did some like Google searching and came across kind of like your your love story, um, your viral love story. Could you guys share a bit more about that? Yeah. Well, you, you're the one who posted it, so you have to. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure, sure. Um, so um, as soon as we got married, I shared our, our love story, which essentially um, initially because I would say most – I don't want to overgeneralize, but I would say most um, traditional Asian parents, they prefer, you know, their sons and daughters to not, to only marry within the race and culture. The culture is really important. And so initially they had a huge pushback um, against uh, me marrying um, Edna. And then, so I, I shared the whole story about how I kept bringing Edna over. And then they, until my, my parents um, finally you know, fell in love with Edna as well because of how sweet and kind she is. Um, so I, I wrote that whole story down. I shared it on a, um, a Facebook group called Subtle Asian Trades. They have like almost two million um, members, and it just blew up and 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 it became viral. <laughs> and then now, and then we got all these uh, blogs writing stories about us. But it was pretty funny because some of them like completely twisted the story. <laughs> yeah. Um, but for the most part, a lot of people, what's amazing about that though, is when he shared it on the page, a lot of people, um, mostly Asian people yeah. uh, were commenting back like, Hey, oh my gosh, like I'm in the same boat or like, yeah, that's, you know, that's what I'm going through with my parents right now. It's so encouraging to see that like your parents, you know, their hearts changed and that they love your relationship now and that they love your spouse. Um, so in that sense, it, it was awesome. I mean, we would get like Facebook messages and Instagram DMs of people that are like, give me advice. Like, what should I do? Yeah. I'm like, I don't <laughs> Your situation is so different. Like, yeah. Huh? And I mean, a lot of people that are like in a lot worse situations. Yeah. Like, I mean, I don't know. Well, we we don't know. I don't remember the name of this person, but this this complete stranger was like, hey, I um. What did he say? He got so disowned. yeah, he got disowned by his family because he decided to marry somebody outside his race, and then wow. his wife left him. <laughs> so I'm like, oh. dang, I know. So now like, you lost your family and you lost your wife. Yeah. I was so like, oh I mean, gosh. people were going through some crazy things, but so that was a that was an interesting time in our. We also got a lot of people, uh, teachers, Asian teachers, who read the story and uh, followed us on Bottle and and got on Bottle. So, hey, it was great in that sense as well. (laughs) That's so awesome. Oh, my goodness. I mean, I'm so glad, um, Clarence, that your parents came around. And Edna, how about your parents? Like, how did they react when they found out that your fiancé or, you know, that you were getting married to like a non-black person? Um, well, my older brother is married to like a white American already. So they're kind of used to it. Um, I think they, I think my mom's only question was like, oh my gosh, like you're going to move to China. That's so far away. And I'm like, mom, he lives in America. Like he's married. <laughs> he's an Asian American. <laughs> like we're not both moving to China. I mean, hey, maybe we will one day. Who knows? But for now, no. Um, so they, I mean, they met him too and they loved him. He's like very easy to love. So they were cool with it. Yeah, they're, they're My dad just really kept open. calling him Filipino and I'm oh, like, yeah. dad, he's not <laughs> Filipino. He's from Singapore. <laughs> oh my gosh. That is he would call me a Filipino friend. Yeah. He's time. like, he's like, tell your Filipino friend. I said, hello. <laughs> <laughs> and growing up for like both of you, did you picture yourselves as like future entrepreneurs or what would you say like sparked your interest in entrepreneurship? Um, 
I would say, I mean, my my dad, he worked in the United Nations, but then after retiring, he became an entrepreneur and went into real estate and, um, you know, built properties and leased them out. Um, and so I, you know, I've watched that since I was younger. My brother, my older brother went into the same real estate business. Um, and so it's always been an interest of mine. Um, but I think only until I met Clarence um, that I realized like, oh, hey, like I could start it now. <laughs> like I don't have to wait, you know, five more years or whatever it is. Like we had something that we were really passionate and wanted to work on and it was good timing. Yep, for sure. Um, on my, my end, I've always wanted to be a stockbroker and a banker growing up. Um, wow. So I went to, yeah, <laughs> that was the initial um, goal. My dad um, really grew this mindset in me that I could be whatever I like. As soon as, as soon as you put your heart to it, and if you're not my, if you don't mind going through hardship, you can achieve anything. So initially, I thought I wanted to be a banker, and then I went, um, I went to work for a couple of mutual funds and banks, and I'm like, wow, this is actually not what I thought it was at all. <laughs> um, so I started. Um, uh, me and a couple friends that uh, we met online, we started a company building games. And that was where I was like really making this, should I jump, you know, from a stable job into like a entrepreneurship? And then it was actually my dad. He was like, hey, son, you know, I, you know, you can, you can always pick up your corporate job again, but then I would regret, just make sure you don't regret and he told me personally that he regretted not starting, you know, a business earlier on and, and playing more safe. So as soon as he said that, I took a plane, flew to South America to start the, the first company. Wow, that's so awesome. And so that first company um, had like a couple different like versions of it, right? Um, like before yeah. becoming what it is today. Yes, that's exactly right. Initially, we were building just normal games, and then um, we we failed a lot. And then we started building games for other people, and that's where we started working on other people's educational games. And then we were like, hey, you know what? Education, um, there's a lot of opportunity here. The growth rate is really high, and this is um, a, a space where there's, there's a lot of good uh, social good involved in this as well. And that's kind of like where... You know, both Edna and I, we drew our passions for kids and education, um, and and now we're hundred percent in. That's so awesome! And so, could you share a bit more about Bottle Learning? We started Bottle um, Valentine's Day of two thousand eighteen, uh, and the focus was to really help um, kids learn in a really fun way to really spark their love for learning. Um, and Clarence being the game designer that he is, um, we knew the approach really to reach kids, because we all know how much kids love games, um, was to deliver this math content through games. And so that's how Bottle was birthed. So we are an um, educational game that delivers first to three, sixth grade math practice and assessments and assignments through a fun online game. And it saves teachers time in grading and also helps them um, track their students' progress. Yeah, and just in case um, people, um, if people are wondering where the name bottle comes from, like what does that mean? Um, you know, we really envisioned, you know, all of us, especially kids, as lifelong learners. So as a learner, you're, you're supposed to collect knowledge and, and, and grow. So. We, we came up with this idea of what if we had uh, all our game characters at, as bottle heads, so their head would be bottles. And then as soon as they learned, their heads would fill up, kind of like collecting knowledge. And um, we also wanted them to really understand the um, importance of character. So when you, when you look at a bottle, what's really um, value about it, valuable about it is what's on the inside um, because a bottle is transparent. And it also has a very good like message as well because, um, you know, one thing that people kept asking us was, so this was really early on, like, what happens when the bottle heads are all full? Do they stop learning? And we're like, no, 
um, when their heads are all full, they get to pour back out in water and grow plants and trees and make the world a better place. So that's kind of like our whole message and yeah. a character in itself. So we just named our whole company after this, um, this, these three messages, which is fill up on learning, value each other for character, and um, pour out to help others. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. And the bottle is B O D D L E. I realize a lot of people when you say bottle the first thought is like, "Oh, B O T T L E." Yeah. yeah. Where should people go if they want to learn more about bottle and what have these past few weeks been like for you guys considering everything that's happening with COVID-19? Um, so I'll answer the, the first question, how people can find out more about it. Um, our website, which is bottlelearning.com. Um, you can jump on there right now uh, throughout this you know COVID period. And until the end of June, we're offering bottle at no cost to teachers and parents that want to sign their kids up. Um, so definitely check it out. We are on social media as well. So follow us on Facebook and Instagram. And YouTube, we've we've been uploading a lot more um, fun YouTube videos, uh, educational videos. So if you have kids at home and you know you want to fun videos for them to learn math, um, definitely follow us on there as well. Um, and yeah, the past few weeks has been super busy for us. Um, before COVID, uh, we were seeing like we're see we were seeing progress, and um, you know we we're kind of planning out. Um, uh, releasing bottle in different school districts. But as soon as COVID hit, obviously all the schools were closed and all the kids are home now. Um, and we just saw a spike in how many students uh, were on our platform and how many teachers were signing up. But along with that, we saw a lot, we've seen a lot of parents sign up as well. And we realized like, wow, yeah, like, you know, right now the parents are educators in the home. Um, so they're getting their kids on bottle, giving them a fun way to learn math and giving them something that's not just entertaining, but also educational, which I think parents really value right now. Um, so yeah, we went from 1700 kids to 26,000 and counting. Uh, it's like 30 something now. Oh, is it? Yeah. <laughs> well, wow. it's gone up. Um, yeah. So very busy, but very grateful just even to, you know, talk with, we've got a live chat support and people would message us on there sometimes for like help with bottle. But once in a while we get these messages of, you know, it's, it's obviously a very frustrating time um, for a lot of people. So we'll, we'll just have somebody like message us and say, oh my gosh, I can't believe, you know, I can't get a flight out of Luxembourg. That was that person. Uh, <laughs> it was like at midnight one time, we got a message from someone from Luxembourg and we're like, we're so sorry. Like, we hope you're doing okay. So Aww. we're it's we're like live support slash therapy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it's been, it's really been fun just to speak with, you know, people from all over the country and the, the world and help them out. And how... Like, what would you say you've learned these past few weeks? Like, is there anything that you're going to be doing differently moving forward now that you've kind of experienced um, just all these shifts that are happening because of the pandemic? Yeah, I would say, you know, parents really are leading the charge and, and putting a focus on their kids' education. And so we, on our end, we are trying to make uh, the process easier for parents to sign up because it was like really focused in on schools. And so the process is very teacher driven and some certain steps that teachers would want to take, but parents don't really need those steps. So trying to create a parent um, version to where they can very easily sign up. Um, it's been interesting also just to figure out um, what sort of tools are being used by different people. So like right now we're only on web, so you have to have a laptop or a Chromebook. Um, but there's a ton of people that use iPads and mobile. And so that's a big focus right now too, trying to get our app version released um, as soon as possible. Um, and then, yeah, it's, it's just been, it's just been interesting to talk to people and find out like, what they, you know, what their needs are in this season and how we can best support them. It's obviously, you know, it, it's unfortunate because there is still a um, a group of uh, students that we cannot necessarily support because they don't have access to um, 
devices and internet. And so that's just been really, you know, eye opening as well. But there are amazing organizations just here in Kansas City um, and around the country, like Kansas City, I would say um, Lean Lab is doing a really good job of, of uh, trying to make sure that, you know, kids get devices and are able to enjoy um, learning online as well. So yeah, it's just, it's been a lot of learning about teachers and parents and the current state of education and accessibility. Yeah, and speaking of that, there's a lot of learning that's going to have to happen in the next couple months because um, we, we've been in, in a lot of like e educational technology, um, like online webinars with uh, peers and also the experts. And, and they don't think that education is going to be go back to normal after this whole thing. Yeah, there'll definitely be a, yeah. a shift. It, yeah, it went from, it went from, and don't quote me on the number. This is I'm just regurgitating the numbers that I heard <laughs> earlier today. But it went from three percent online learning to now close to eighty percent online learning overnight. Oh, and it was, it, I think, it's one of those like, um, kind of like everybody knew that education was so behind. You know, ten years ago they were saying how everybody had one-to-one -one devices, were online, were were ready for remote learning, and then as soon as this happened, it's kind of like a they just accelerated the education industry 10 years because of this whole COVID thing. So I think this is going to be one of those situations where companies and entrepreneurs have to be very nimble, really have to try to learn um, what the new landscape is going to look like. And I don't think anybody knows for sure. Um, so it's going to be one of those. This is what we learned, but we're going to have to keep our eyes open and keep learning and just try new things. Absolutely. And could you guys speak a little to the opportunity in the ed tech space? Like, I know there aren't that many solutions out there for um, kids that, you know, learn from home or, you know, there aren't too many tools out there. Um, so for those who are maybe interested in entrepreneurship and education, could you just share a bit more about, like, how much room there is really like in the space and how fast maybe the the industry is growing yeah sure so i think i i don't so know for me well i don't yeah. know i guess when you're in a space it seems saturated right like whatever industry you might be in so um i don't know i feel like the tools are out there there are tools but a lot of them are really old okay that, that's mostly right. because um because the education industry has not moved. Mm. And because they have not moved, this is where technology providers have to use technologies that or build technologies that accommodate like really old devices and things like that. And that was one of the big things that, you know, we encountered with our previous company um, that we, we started. You know, we built this cool 3D game. It was literally almost like World of Warcraft and none of the schools could actually even run the program because, you know, they're the access to technology was so um, far behind. And so um, I think kind of like what Edna said, there are quite a lot of tools out there, but there is a strong desire and an appetite in the market for tools that mimic and look like um, tools that are used outside of education. So, so for example, games um, or gamification in education. It was growing at, I think, 34% every year in 2015. Now it's going, growing at like 66%, if I think I have the numbers right. But it's, it's just growing really, really fast because there's a huge demand for things that, you know, really mimic, like, how, how can you compete? How can you, like, use an educational game from 10 years ago and compare it with Fortnite? It's just yeah. not going to, it's not going to hold up. So would you say that demand is coming from students or educators or like who is saying like we want more interactive ways to learn? Yeah, I think it depends on in the demographics. I think in Asian countries, um, the demand is more driven by parents. I think here in the U.S. is about I feel it's half half. I Don't quote me on it, but I feel it's half half. And yeah, thank you uh, for sharing more about that. And could you guys share a bit more about what it's like to work 
um, on a startup with your spouse or your partner? Like, does that ever get tricky or do you guys kind of have it handled? Um, I think we have it handled pretty well because the areas a bottle that Clarence has expertise in, I'm just like so lost. And then the areas where I know I'm very strong in, I think he also recognizes that like, okay, yeah, like I'll let you, you know, make the decisions on the marketing and, you know, certain operational things. And when it comes to the software and stuff, you know, he, he teaches me and I'm like, okay, yep, you take the lead. Um, so we rarely, we rarely butt heads in that way. I think there is a learning curve though, uh, when we first very when we first started, it, there's a lot that you just have to um, not take offense to. Like I think when we first started, if I would if I would like create a marketing piece and then I would show it to him and he would say, "Ah, oh, I, I really don't like it." I would at first take that as like, a, "Oh my gosh, he's insulting me." But then I had to like take several steps back and be like, "Okay, no, it has nothing to do with you. It literally just has to do with the marketing piece in front of you right now." So like just really training myself and and learning that, you know, when you're running a business, you really can't take offense to things. And the more you learn to not take offense to things, that's when like everybody can be like completely honest. And that's what we try and tell our team too, like honesty and communication first, because we don't want to like, we, we want to put out stuff that's excellent. And in order to do that, we have to be like completely honest with each other, even when we don't like things. Um, and then communicate if we think something is awesome, like don't hold it in, like tell, tell the person that, Hey, this is awesome. So yeah, it's, I, I think it's been good. Yeah. We're still trying to work through this, like work life balance. You know, I don't really know what that means. <laughs> yeah. Man, um, I can imagine. <laughs> yeah. So we, we try right now. Um, what is helping? Uh, oh, you know, what's helping, um, there is a show on Netflix called Madam C.J. Walker. Amazing show. Yes. Um, I, just, I finished it have a you, couple weeks ago. Have you ago. watched it? Yes. It's nice. So, good. <laughs> so that is like our, our breaks. So we're like, okay, we really need to just like get our mind off work. We're like, let's get on Netflix and watch Madam C.J. Walker. Yeah. yeah, we think it's bad. And we're like, you know what? We're not selling hair growth products. <laughs> Seriously. That show really like makes me feel like empowered. Like, yes, I'm going to go conquer the world. Absolutely. Yeah, it's super inspiring. And it's it's just so awesome to be able to visually kind of see um, Madam C.J. Walker's story because I feel like I've always just kind of read about her. So just to kind of picture her um, yeah. or what, you know, what she could have looked like and, you know, acted like, that was really cool to see for sure. Yeah. And so I'd love to spend some time talking about where you guys see Bottle in the next, you know, let's say five years. And if you have any sort of plans to expand to emerging economies and specifically like the African continent, I'd, I'd love to hear about that. Yeah, I'll, I'll talk about the where we're going as a company and then you can talk about how mm -hmm. we're expanding because that's something that's on her on our heartstrings for sure. So. Um, as, as background information, what was very fundamental to the way we've developed our product or technology is that, um, we, our program allows other content providers to actually load curriculum onto our platform. And then it, it becomes online courses that are part of, um, games. So essentially let's say a publisher or, um, or a school or institution can load all their tests, all their homework, all their online courses package it and deliver it to students through games. So we do have a, a huge um, appetite to expand, but we know it's probably going to be um, be through local partners, whether we're localizing our product to, to you know, have different languages or we're loading curriculum and, and content that is from, you know, local publishers so that is more relevant to different areas. So, for example, if I were to expand to Singapore, I would probably look for a Singapore math company um, that would partner up to load their math curriculum, and then we can help out, help them out with their, you know, standardized tests for kids who are like 11, 12 years old. If we were to go to, um, you know, Latin America, we'll find a publisher that could provide that content. So that that way, 
we are more so a, a vehicle to make content and curriculum fun rather than having to build our own content and taking forever for us to expand into different markets. And then um, expanding into the African continent for sure is definitely on our hearts. Um, I think we're um, right now we're focusing on, you know, getting that app version done and then really figuring out a strategy. Um, we do have a couple of people from Ghana that signed up like um, two weeks ago. So I was really awesome. excited. I was sending them like Ghana flag memes through the group, through the our chat um, on the website. Um, so, yeah. We definitely, we definitely want to do it in, at, at a larger scale. We we do have, you know, because I have family in in Ghana and Uganda, so they help to like spread the word. And I know like my nieces and nephews in Uganda use it, and so we do have um, some usage on the continent. But we definitely are trying to figure out like a strategy of like, okay, well, how do we like roll it out in schools um, and just make it more accessible to more people yeah so i think in terms of steps is probably get it on ipads and mobile yeah, first that's the and first. then work with a local like content partner so that we can get um either translations or a, a wider variety of um curriculum curriculum yeah wow awesome yeah thank you both for for sharing more about that that's i think that would be really cool to see um you guys expand um and you know reach users on the continent um, I wouldn't, I would say there's, um, there's a shortage of tools available that are like widely available for students. Um, mm -hmm. especially now that like even back home in my country, um, Zambia schools are closed and like my little cousins, like the ones that live with my grandma, like two of them, um, have like assignments like online um and thankfully like you know they're able to like afford data and like wi-fi and stuff like that um mm -hmm. but that's like not the norm or the standard um especially back home so i think it'll be interesting to see what tools um and like apps um sort of come out in the next few years and how we address like that digital divide because it's Right. It's, uh, it's a it's a huge issue back home, especially. So, yep, yeah. Sure. Yeah, that would be interesting to see. So, yeah, thank you both uh, for being on the show and just sharing more about Bottle and your journeys and where you see yourselves in the next few years. I, I really appreciate you being on the show. Yeah, thank you so yeah, much. My pleasure. This is great. Absolutely. Thank you so much for tuning in. I really enjoyed that conversation with Edna and Clarence. Be sure to check out Bottle at BottleLearning.com. They have built such a great tool for young people. So if you have kids or you have little siblings around, be sure to check them out and have them download Bottle. Also, if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe and join the Dear Diaspora mailing list. So every month I am going to be curating a newsletter just covering all things Dear Diaspora, providing entrepreneurship resources, different like business insights, and also just really inspirational content. So be sure to subscribe and join the mailing list by clicking the link in the description. Thanks for listening to Dear Diaspora. If you like what you hear, subscribe, rate, and review us on iTunes. You can find us on Instagram at Dear Diaspora or visit our website at DearDiasporaShow.com. Thank you and talk to you next week.